Scope of employment. Scope of employment. In the last module, we went over the first requirement in order for the boss essentially to be held liable for the torts of the employee. That is, that a master-servant relationship must exist. That's not always and exclusively an employer-employee relationship, but most of the time it is. Most of the time it is. So for purposes of this, this lecture, we'll use the term employee and servant interchangeably. So just bear that in mind. So having gone over what constitutes a master-servant relationship, which is the first hurdle the plaintiff has to overcome in order to hold the employer liable for the torts of the employee, let's talk about the second and even more complicated element, which is that the employee must have committed the tort within the scope of his or her employment. The employee must have been acting within the scope of employment, or the agent must have been acting within the scope of the agency in order for the principal or the employer to be held liable for the torts of the employee. Now, scope of employment seems like it should be straightforward, seems like it shouldn't be all that complicated. It seems like one of those things that you ought to be able to intuitively tell when somebody is acting within the scope of their employment and when they're not. However, the concept is a little convoluted. That's why we've dedicated two, count them, two modules to elucidating it.